I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me to give a talk in this very interesting session. And good morning, everyone. I'll start very briefly with talking about the historical beginnings of the squid. I'll talk about how we make them today. I'm sorry, maybe it's And after that, I will focus for most of the talk on some applications, mostly about medicine and cosmology. The squid is a superconducting device, and it all started in 1911 when Camel and Honors discovered superconductivity in a thread of mercury. And he cooled this down in liquid helium to its, to its boiling point, 4.2 Kelvin, and what he discovered was that all the electrical resistance vanished. After that promising beginning, however, it took almost a half century to understand the origin of superconductivity. And at that point, Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer showed that the superconductor was enabled by the pairing of electrons to form so-called Cooper pairs. And these are actually condensed into a single macroscopic quantum state. And so it's the flow of these pairs through a superconductor that give rise to the supercurrent. <coughs> well, after that slow beginning, superconducting electronics actually took place in a rather short time. And the first experiment was on flux quantization in 1961. If one has a superconducting ring carrying a supercurrent, it will, of course, produce a magnetic flux phi in the ring but this flux cannot take arbitrary values, but is quantized in units of the flux quantum phi zero, Planck's constant over the Cooper pair charge 2e. And it's about 2 times 10 to the minus 15 Tesla meters squared. The following year, 1962, saw Brian Josephson's brilliant introduction of Josephson tunneling. And the essential idea there is that if one has two superconductors separated by a thin insulating barrier, Cooper pairs are able to tunnel through the barrier without generating any dissipation and without generating any resistance. And subsequently, just one year later, at Bell Labs, Anderson and Rao made the first observation of Josephson tunneling. And this was with a tunnel junction made of tin, tin oxide lead and I'm plotting here the current they observed versus the voltage across the device. And as you see, as we increase the current from zero, initially no voltage is developed. And so that's the Josephson DC effect. And subsequently, at higher currents, there will be a transition to the voltage state. Now, the squid is the combination of these two ideas. And in essence, it consists of a superconducting loop interrupted by two Josephson junctions. We can pass a current through them and look at the voltage across them. If we start to change the magnetic flux, then what we will find is that the maximum supercurrent as a function of this flux will oscillate. And needless to say, the period is the flux quantum. Here is the schematic from their first paper this was by uh, a group at the Ford Motor Company in 1964. On the bottom, we have a tin film. We form two Josephson junctions, one and two, at these points here. And then this is a continuous film. But in the middle, we have a very thick insulating layer that makes the loop as indicated in this sketch. If we now apply a magnetic field perpendicular to this figure, what, we, what they showed was that the maximum supercurrent versus applied field would oscillate as they change that field. And these rapid oscillations are actually due to interference between these macroscopic wave functions. And the essential physics is very analogous to two-slit interference in optics. And hence, the acronym SQUID containing interference. Well, SQUIDs are made today using thin films of superconductor. Uh, this first early device was by Mark Ketchen, who was my former graduate student at the time. Um, the dark blue color is a chip, for example, silicon, on which has been deposited a 
niobium film, that's the light blue color, maybe a millimeter across. In the middle, there's a hole, and then there's a slit to the outside edge, and just outside that edge are grown two Josephson junctions, one here and here, connected by a loop. So if you pass a current from left to right, you can see that the current flows through the junctions, and you've made your squid. Very commonly, on top of this is deposited a thin film of superconductor niobium, and it's insulated electrically from the wafer. And the basic idea is that if you pass a current around this coil, it will couple flux into the squid. And as we'll see in a moment, that's very useful. These are made today on wafer-scale wafer processes on large wafers, many, many thousands, hundreds of thousands on a wafer, uh, with photolithographic patterning. With suitable readout electronics at 4.2 Kelvin, a typical flux noise might be 10 to the minus 6 flux quanta in the unit bandwidth. And as we will see later on, at sufficiently low temperatures, squids can be quantum limited. Many squids are operated in the flux lock loop with negative feedback. So here's a squid, current biased. If you make a small change in the flux in the squid, the output of this electronics will give you a voltage, and that is coupled as a current via a resistor back into a coil inductively coupled to the squid. So that the purpose of this is to keep the flux in the squid loop fixed but there will be an output voltage that is linearly proportional to the input flux change. And this will, has two advantages. It gives you a linear response and also enables you to operate the device over a very large dynamic range, maybe hundreds or thousands of flux quanta. A very popular application of squids, as we'll see, is magnetometry. And one can greatly enhance the magnetic field sensitivity of the squid by coupling a superconducting circuit containing a superconducting pickup loop to the coil that we saw earlier. And if you apply a magnetic field to this loop, because of flux quantization, a current is forced to flow around the circuit, coupling flux into the squid. And the typical device that we use today might have a magnetic field noise of about a femtotesla per root hertz. Well, now let me move on to applications of the squid. And I'm going to start off with just a couple of very quick mentions of things that have had significant commercial impact. I think that the most widely used squid-based system is the physical properties measurement system by quantum design. Uh, here's a photograph of a fairly modern version and the basic idea is that you have a squid in here which can measure all kinds of different properties of a variety of samples, magnetic, electrical, thermal, over a wide temperature range. You can buy a version with a dilution refrigerator that gets you to 50 millikelvin. There is a Tesla, a magnet that will get you as much as 16 Tesla of field. Um, and Today, I think most people buy a version with a cryocooler so that uh, you don't have to buy liquid helium every few days in order to keep the system going. I understand that there are more than 1,000 of these in, in use worldwide. And the kinds of things that people measure range from blood samples to high transition temperature superconductors. So this has had a huge impact on what people do in labs. A very different application is in geophysics, and this was work pioneered by Cathy Foley in Australia. And you can see that we're in a somewhat wild part of the Earth's surface. Um, and here, in a little duo of liquid nitrogen, we have a bunch of high TC squids configured as magnetometers. And the way this works in brief is as follows. One has a large diameter, maybe 200 meter coil on the surface, you pulse it with a large current. This generates a magnetic field in the, in the ground, and therefore eddy currents. And what one does is to measure the magnetic field decay from these induced currents. And this depends strongly on the conductivity of what's down there. 
And so if you have the right kind of software, which they do, then you can map out the conductivity of a subsurface as a function of position and depth. And I think the most famous discovery there was in uh, a village called Cannington, uh, where a squid-based system like this discovered about $2 billion worth of silver, which is the largest deposit of silver ever discovered, and it had been missed by all other kinds of detection techniques. And uh, Kathy tells me that this, this technique, which has been quite widely developed by geophysical search companies, has, developed about six, has discovered about $6 billion worth of mineral deposits in various parts of the world. So now let me move on to medicine. I think the most widely used system of squids in medicine is to do magnetoencephalography, MEG. And this is a, 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 a system marketed by MEG in Megan. And I understand there are about 125 of these currently in use around the world. And what you see here is that there's this lady having her head developed, uh, her head examined by, by this system. Well, inside this helmet, there is liquid helium, but there are also 306 squids. And these are made on silicon chips arranged, as you see here in this photograph. And there are 102 magnetometers, and there are 204 that turns out are configured as gradiometers. And these are all cooled to 4.2 Kelvin in the fiberglass dewar. Uh, again, these systems are now available with helium gas recycling and a cryocooler, so you don't have to keep spending money on liquid helium. And the system is surrounded by a magnetically shielded room to remove external magnetic noise so that you can make very sensitive measurements. Well, what's it good for? Well, uh, first of all, I note there are other companies making these systems, and I believe there are about 200 of them around the world. And there are two basic modes. The first is spontaneous signals. And even if you're asleep, your brain is very active. And it produces uh, currents in, in the neurons and of course, those produce a magnetic field which your squid system can map. So those are spontaneous signals. Secondly, there are stimulated signals. And so as you listen to my voice, your auditory cortex is producing these magnetic fields. So I could actually tell whether or not you're paying attention. <laughs> now, what can you do with that? Well, I think that the single most important clinical application is in pre-surgical mapping of brain tumors, and with a rather similar uh, technique, locating and pre-surgical mapping of epileptic centers. And in a moment, I'll talk about the first of these. But there are lots of other emerging applications that are being studied, both in hospitals and in, in, in uh, various research labs around the world. And the kinds of things that people are doing is to monitor recovery from stroke, traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress disorder, Alzheimer's disease, autism, and dyslexia, and a whole bunch of other things. So let me give one example now. And this is of stimulated magnetoencephalography. And in this particular experiment, a checkerboard was flashed into the uh, left visual quadrant of the subject. And it's repeated every second. And this is the average that you see from a single squid channel after 100 uh, averages. And what you see, there's a very clean uh, signal that looks like this as a function of time. And then when you take the data from all of these different uh, squid channels, you can actually generate a magnetic field pattern that looks like that of a dipole. And so when you do a fit, you can figure out where in the brain this particular signal arose. And this is a particularly vivid example, I think, of the kinds of things that people can, can do with this, that is having a huge impact. And this person was lucky, OK? So this one person had a very fortunate outcome. What we're looking at here 
is uh, an MRI of the brain of this patient, and the surgeon has removed a tumor, a rather large tumor, as you can see. But what you also see here are these colored dots, and the dots were obtained from the MEG imagery. And so some of them were from tactile uh, responses from the feet or the hand, the lip, also from the auditory cortex. And what you see is that these responses enabled the surgeon to remove the tumor without hitting any vital parts of the brain. And so this is now being uh, increasingly developed in several countries around the world as a way of enormously reducing the potential damage due to tumor surgery. Now I want to move on to cosmology, which addresses the question of why are we all here. Um, the cosmic microwave background, the CMB, or also known as the, cos the, the cosmic Rosetta Stone, has, reduced, has produced an enormous wealth of information about the universe. And here you see the uh, power spectrum of the microwave background, and it is a black body curve with a temperature of about 2.7 Kelvin. And that gives you a peak uh, wavelength of about two millimeters in the far infrared. Now this originated 379,000 years after the Big Bang, and it's been traveling for about $14 billion since then until our squid saw it. Now what we've learned from all this is that we actually live in a rather bizarre universe, that the total number of, ordin of baryons, ordinary matter, is about 5% of the universe. That's us. Um, but in addition, there is dark energy, and that's about two-thirds of the universe. And about a quarter of the universe is cold, dark matter. So we have no clue as to what most of the universe is. And squids are being used to investigate both dark energy and cold, dark matter. And I've had a, a small role in both of these uh, from the squid end. Well, first of all, let's talk about dark energy, searching for galaxy clusters. Now, a galaxy cluster contains several hundred galaxies. We think of a galaxy as being a large thing, but it's nothing compared with a cluster. And these are, needless to say, the largest objects in the universe with a mass of, say, 10 to the 14th or 10 to the 15th <coughs> solar masses. And measuring the density of galaxy clusters as a function of redshift would enable us to, deter to determine the equation of state for dark energy. And so that would make a huge impact on what we understand about dark energy. But in order to do that, you have to find thousands of galaxy clusters. So the catch is that in order to measure the, to, to find these galaxy clusters optically, it's very difficult because the optical signal is very weak if you don't know where the cluster is. And fortunately, there's this technique called the sunyev zeldovich SE effect, which is a search technique based on superconducting sensors and squids that make this a very viable project. Well, what is the SC effect? In, bril in, in brief, it's the following. In the, inside a galaxy cluster, it turns out that there is a hot electron gas. And if a microwave background photon is incident on this hot electron gas and scattered, then it will be scattered towards the blue. In other words, it will be slightly more energetic from the scattering process. And so one can calculate uh, how much of a shift in the power spectrum that would give. And it's illustrated on the right here. The blue curve is the standard black body spectrum. The red is the SC shifted spectrum times 100. So we're looking for an incredibly small change in this power spectrum. And that, needless to say, requires very sensitive detectors in the far infrared, and superconductivity solves the problem for us. This is the so-called transition edge sensor. And the basic idea is that you have a superconductor, this is resistance versus temperature, 
biased in the transition region. And that means that if you have a small change in the temperature, you will change the resistance and you can measure that. The TES consists of some kind of optical absorber uh, which, on which is deposited the superconducting film and it's biased with a voltage so that any current flowing uh, around the circuit is coupled via the, the coil on the squid into the squid. So if there is this arrival of a photon on this absorber, then for a moment, the resistance will increase. But because of the voltage bias of this circuit, the current will decrease, and therefore the dissipation from the current will decrease. And so the net result of all of this is that the temperature of the TES stays fixed, but there is a signal induced into the, into the squid. So it's negative feedback once again, which is a very powerful tool. Um, and one can design these so that basically you're limited by fluctuations in the, in the photon gas. Now, this is all well and good, but what you would like to do is to have an enormous number of TESs on a telescope, as we'll see in a minute, but you'd rather not have an equivalently enormous number of squids. And in the early 2000s, my good friend and colleague, Paul Richards, uh, he came to see me one day and he said, John, do you have a minute? And he said, could you figure out a way to read out more than one TES with just one squid? And I said, well, that was an interesting problem to think about, so I thought about it. And this is what came out. So this is a multiplexer. And the basic idea is that we can read out an array of these TESs with a single squid. And Briefly, the way it works is the following, that each of the TESs has in series uh, an L and a C to make a resonant circuit, and each resonant frequency is different. We drive these LC circuits with a comb of different frequencies, and these are all summed together, fed into our squid amplifier, and then at the end demodulated. So that for each TES, we get a signal at a different frequency, and we can figure out what happened. So the net result of the TES structure is shown here. The absorber is a spider web, about five millimeters in diameter. Uh, it's actually made of silicon nitride with a thin control layer of gold on the top to make it conducting. And then right at the middle of the spider web, there's this little gold disk. And right down here at the bottom is a TES. It's just 25 microns across. So that's the thing that gives you all the sensitivity. And in the first manifestation of this on South Pole Telescope in 2006, you can see that we have a, a, a mount here. And inside that, there are 960 TESs. The multiplexing factor at the beginning was just eight. So you get eight TESs per squid. And because each squid actually has 100 squids in it, there are 12,000 squids that make this possible. So to conclude on this, this is a photograph of South Pole Telescope, which is on the Antarctica, 9,500 feet. It has a 10-meter dish. And basically, all the incoming uh, cosmic background radiation is, is focused up here and inside this column, you have all the uh, detection system. Uh, on this current version, there are 16,000 TSs. Um, but the multiple multiplexing factor is 68 now. So you can read out 68 TESs from basically one squid. Uh, the total number of squids is about 24,000. And so far, roughly 1,000 galaxy clusters have been discovered with this technique. You still need more, but these are ongoing experiments. And a large collaboration has been involved in this over the last many years. So the last topic I want to talk about is cold dark matter, the hunt for the axion. Now, the name of the game in looking at cold dark matter is, what is it? What are the particles that people believe constitute cold dark matter. 
And a very highly motivated candidate is the so-called axion. And that is a, a hypothetical elementary particle that uh, was postulated some 40 years ago to resolve a particular problem in particle theory concerned with quantum chromodynamics. And also, at the same time, it would explain why the uh, neutron doesn't have a measurable electric dipole moment. So there's a good reason to think that the axion could exist. Of course, it's never been seen. Now, calculations of QCD indicate that the mass range of the axion are, are somewhere between 1 and 1 microvolt and 1 MeV. So it's an incredibly light particle. And the important point is that in the presence of a magnetic field, the axion is predicted, is predicted to convert into a photon, and the frequency of the photon is determined by the mass of, of the axion. So this is a little schematic of how this is supposed to work. You have a cavity, and here's an axion decaying to give you a photon, and surrounding the cavity is a large superconducting magnet. And because you don't know what the mass of the axion is, you don't know what the frequency of the photons are going to be. So here's a little picture of what you're looking for. Here's the power in the cavity versus frequency. And if you have the axion converting into a photon, you suddenly get this peak in the power. And so in order to do that, the cavity has to be on resonance with the photon frequency. Now, the photons are then detected with an antenna in the original version. This is going back to the uh, early 1990s. Detected with a semiconductor amplifier. And this is actually a high electron mobility transistor, a HEMP. Now, what are the issues here? Well, first of all, um, in this conversion process, which I don't propose to go through, the power from this conversion scales as this quantity g, which is the coupling coefficient between the axion and the photon. And there's a particular theory which gives the value of this coupling coefficient. Now, in order to make progress on this, I need to introduce briefly the idea of noise temperature of an amplifier. So here's an amplifier. And the input is a resistor, R, at a temperature T input. And at the output of the amplifier, we see noise. And the power spectrum of that noise has two components. First of all, the first component is the familiar Nyquist noise, 4K Boltzmann T times R. But in addition, there is the noise from the amplifier. And the noise from the amplifier, we quantify in terms of T noise. I should just comment here, and we'll come back to that, that in principle, an amplifier can be limited by quantum noise. So in the original concept of this detector, the system noise temperature was going to be about 3 Kelvin. That's the sum of the cavity temperature, 1.5 Kelvin, and a comparable value from HEMT. By the way, semiconductors are very noisy, as we'll see. Um, and then from this, you can figure out from the equation I showed a moment ago how long it would take to scan over, say, a factor of two in frequency. And here's a formula here. You'll notice it goes as the square of the system noise temperature. And the result was 270 years. Now, that's a problem. It's very difficult to get funding for an experiment that's going to take that long. It's also very hard to get graduate students. So, <laughs> So at this time, the two PIs on the project, this is 94, Rosenberg and Van Bibbers, came to me and said, would a screwed amplifier be better? And I said, well, uh, we don't normally make uh, squids operating at these frequencies, but let's think about it. And so we thought about it. And what we came out with is called the MSA, the Microscript Squid Amplifier. And here's an object that looks more or less like a squid with one subtle difference, that the signal to be amplified is coupled to one end of the coil and to the squid washer, and the other end of the coil is left open. 
And remember that the coil is electrically insulated from the washer. And so if you now have a signal applied to give you a half wavelength in the coil, then you get a large standing wave, as you would expect, and therefore you get a very large uh, signal out from the squid. Well, uh, these are, have progressed, and, how, and here is uh, a recent measurement of the noise temperature, which uh, was for a device to be put on the, the squid detector. And I'm plotting here the noise temperature Tn versus the bath temperature. And what you see is that as we lower the bath temperature, the noise temperature goes down and down and down, and eventually it flattens out. And in this particular case, it flattens out at a factor of about 50% above the quantum limit. So it's very close to being a quantum limited amplifier. So what's the impact on the axion detector? Well, remember, in the original manifestation, the system noise temperature was about 3 Kelvin. Now we have a squid amplifier with a noise temperature of 50 millikelvin. And in the next, meaning the current generation, we're going to cool the cavity in a dilution refrigerator to, say, 50 millikelvin. And the bottom line is that we now have a system noise temperature of 0.1 Kelvin. And we can now recalculate our scanning time for a particular set of cavity parameters. And instead of 270 years, it's now 100 days. So you can see that the squid has an unbelievably large impact on the viability of this experiment. So DOE said, fine, we'll fund it. And so this is the current Axion Dark Matter experiment, ADMX, at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, the cavity is at the bottom here. And in youth, this whole assembly is put into a cold cryostat run by a dilution refrigerator at about 150 millikelvin, although it will go colder, and a magnetic field of 7 Tesla. So that's the current status of ADMX. And either this week or maybe next week, there are a, a paper in PRL will appear online. And it, I can't tell you what the numbers are at this point. But over restricted frequency range, ADMX is now able to attain the limit set by this parameter g. And therefore, this will enab enable a viable search for the axion over some range of frequency. And it only took 23 years to get there. So, uh, once again, there are a large number of groups involved in this project. And to sum up, I'd just like to say a few more words about squids. I've been working on these for a half century, and in part because they're so diverse in the frequency in physics and chemistry and biology, medicine, material science, geophysics, cosmology, quantum information, lots of things to do with them. And they can be used to measure current, voltage, resistance, magnetic field, magnetic field gradient, susceptibility, temperature, energy, and so on. They can be broadband anywhere from, say, 10 to minus 4 hertz in geophysics to a number of gigahertz in uh, axion detectors. At low temperatures, the resolution of squids is essentially limited by the uncertainty principle. And the three applications I've talked about uh, magnetoencephalography, looking for galaxy clusters, and the axion detector are examples of a host of applications that only exist because of the extraordinary low noise of the squid. Thank you for listening. Uh, that was uh, great, John. And um, uh, so I'd like to open up to questions. So please go ahead. John, uh, as, you, as you well know, uh, there's been an effort for quite a number of years to develop squid-based magnetocardiography as an addition and an alternative to electrocardiography. And you can do three-dimensional imaging of currents in the heart. It all works. Why? It all works. It's been very successful, but it doesn't seem to have taken hold in the medical profession. No. 
Why, why not? Yeah. So the, the question was, what about magneto in, uh, cardiology, which is looking at the signals from the heart? And um, as Paul points out, I mean, that's been very successfully developed, but why isn't it used? And I think the, the fact is that, first of all, it's expensive compared with various other techniques that are also very successful. And um, for example, I, I, um, for various reasons, a, a year or two ago, I had ultrasound imaging of, of my heart. And this is fantastic. I mean, they show me the images. And although they may be somewhat different from what you get with a squid system, um, I think that the information they got out of that was what the cardiologists needed. Um, I think that having said that, there are a few places around the world, and particularly in Japan, where uh, magnetocardiology is, is used, and I think used quite successfully. But I think it's not propagated simply because of you know, the cost versus the benefit. Okay. Okay. Well, let's have another question, please. <clears throat> uh, let me ask a question then. Uh, the, you showed us a picture of the brain. And unfortunately, the person had a tumor in the brain. Was that picture taken by MRI? Yes. If, if so, yes. Uh, so uh, uh, challenging again the, the applicability of the squid is that uh, as long as they were doing MRI anyway, they could do functional MRI, and maybe they would also learn uh, the same thing. Yeah. So that's a, that's a good question. Functional MRI um, you know, works quite well, but the resolution is lousy. Right. I mean, you could not get this kind of resolution using uh, functional MRI. And I have to tell you that I didn't take the time to talk about it. It's about to get better. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's about to get better is that we, um, we developed a technique to do ultra-low field magnetic resonance imaging in something comparable with the Earth's field. And that can be piggybacked onto an MEG system so that the same array of squids can see both the MEG signal and also can locate where they come from. And I think that in the next two, three years, we're probably going to see an even better resolution than we, than we saw that. That's great. OK. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yes, uh, just here, let me hand you the microphone. For the geophysical applications, clearly the high TC squids work very well. But are you giving up anything? Would would it work um, even better with the low TC squids? Yes, it would. Um, we actually used low TC squids for geophysics way back in the 1970s. There's no doubt that you get a lower noise, but the the cost and the difficulty of getting liquid helium to some remote part of the world. It was just too big a challenge. Um, I think the, the, the bottom line on that is that the high TC squids have higher noise, but you average longer. You take more, you take more readings of the same pulse, and therefore you get a, 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 us, a usable signal to noise. And the fact is that they're much better than coils. I mean, the, the, the sort of earlier manifestation of these kinds of techniques use coils as detectors. But then Faraday's law gets you, because the, the voltage you get out of a coil um, obviously goes as the rate of change of flux, and you get a lower frequency as the signal goes down. But the great beauty of the squid is that the response is dead flat, down to zero frequency. And so that gives you a tremendous edge over uh, the coils, which otherwise you would think would be a, a cheaper technology. <laughs>